Hi, everybody. Welcome back to another Koinonia Hour. As you can see, I have Fred Tomlinson back with me again, and I want to warmly welcome you back to the little green pasture. <laughs> well, thank you, Gioni. It really is genuinely a pleasure to be here with you on this channel, and I appreciate the opportunity to talk to these people who are your people, uh, it uh, really is a privilege for me. Um, I want to centre my talk today around um, a question which I think all of us, um, hope I'm not being presumptuous when I say that, but I think all of us ask ourselves from time to time. Perhaps some of us do it more frequently than others. Um, but the question is this, did I make the right decision? Um, and that can be sort of formed in a variety of different ways, but that, that's what it amounts to as I'm thinking about it just now. And, uh, it, uh, you know, there are times, uh, perhaps it has to do with getting older, but you have sleepless nights. And it's often during those sleepless nights when your mind is thinking and wondering, and perhaps there's been some particular issue you've been involved with or some a decision that you've made or didn't make, whatever the case may be. And the question comes to your mind, did I make the right decision? And uh, I think I think that kind of thing, you know, wanting to make the right decision is something everyone shares. Um, but the fact is, when you're a Christian, when you love the Lord and uh, you're, you're uh, anxious to hear him speaking to you and directing you and uh, and you're anxious to respond properly um, uh, as as uh, as is required and uh, as human beings i think there are times when we ask ourselves you know did i respond properly in that situation well with all of that in mind my bible's open here to the book of Acts, the Acts of the Apostles, and in chapter 21. Um, I'm thinking about the Apostle Paul in this particular session, just because of the nature of the way I think I'm going to proceed. Um, there's a sense in which um, I might be all over the place a little bit here, because the Apostle Paul occupies such a large section of this part of the Acts of the Apostles. And the issue that I want to draw out is kind of, it, it's all over the, that section. Well, I can't read it all. I hope you might want to at some point. Um, but um, in chapter 21, um, let me just read a few verses. I'm going to read uh, from verse 8 and uh, down a little ways from there. Um, the next day, we that were of Paul's company departed and came into Caesarea, and we entered into the house of Philip the evangelist, which was one of the seven, and abode with him. And the same man had four daughters, virgins, which did prophesy. And as we tarried there many days, there came down from Judea a certain prophet named Agabus, and when he was come to us, he took Paul's girdle and bound his own hands and feet and said, Thus saith the Holy Ghost, so shall the Jews at Jerusalem bind the man that owneth this girdle and shall deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. And when we heard these things, both we and they of that place besought him not to go up to Jerusalem. Then Paul answered, what mean ye to weep and to break my heart? For I am ready, not to be bound only, but also to die at Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. And when he would not be persuaded, we ceased saying, the will of the Lord be done. Amen. This particular incident um, uh, here, and there's a lot that could be said about it in particular, which I can't do in this session, but um, it, 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 it evolved uh, as these next chapters continue on. Um, you see, 
Um, a little lower down, the Apostle Paul, having left that particular setting, uh, he's now in, uh, in Jerusalem, and I'm looking down into verse um, um, 21 and on. I can't read all that. I wish I could. Um, but we get down to um, verse 27. Let me read. And when the seven days were almost ended, the Jews, which were in Asia, when they saw him in the temple, they stirred up all the people and laid hands on him, crying out, men of Israel, help. This is the man that teacheth all men everywhere against the people and the law and this place. And further besought Greeks also into the temple and hath polluted this holy place. For they had seen before uh, with him in the city Trophimus uh, from Ephesus, uh, whom they supposed that Paul had brought into the temple. And then the whole city was moved and ran together and all chaos breaks loose there in this situation. And uh, the, the, that, that trigger there that, that's taking place, it's Paul, he's got his mind set on going to Jerusalem. Uh, if we were to read more brief, widely, we'd see that there were several different occasions uh, uh, leading up to the occasion where we've met Agabus the prophet, uh, where the saints of God uh, have cautioned uh, um, the Apostle Paul that he, he, he should not go to Jerusalem at all. And you heard Paul respond in the verse I quoted a little earlier. We said, what are you trying to do to make me weep and break my heart? He said, I'm, I'm set to do this. I'm not ready just to be bound i'm ready to die for the lord jesus and uh, and they and they saw his, his determination his commitment as it were and they backed off at that point and said well may the will of the lord be done in this matter <clears throat> then he goes on into the temple area and there's a number of things that are developing here in this chapter uh, leading up to this response from the jewish leadership and uh, they, they think they've got Paul on this issue um, of um, taking one of his Gentile friends into the into the area of the temple, which in, in which Gentiles were prohibited to go. Um, there's actually no suggestion that Paul did that. In fact, did you notice? Uh, how in verse 29 that I read to you, it said they supposed that he'd done it. In other words, they they saw an opportunity to make uh, 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 to accuse him, uh, and they weren't very interested in whether there was going to be proof of an evidence. Uh, they were just making the accusation, and uh, the next thing you know, the whole city's riled up, and things really break loose uh, in a big way. And and that that triggers and starts off a whole series of, of developments and situations, which, as a matter of fact, are, occupy um, the next six chapters of the Acts of the Apostles, right up to the very end. As a matter of fact, and so we're we're at a, a point here when um, this was this was the moment when it really really came apart for Paul and and so on. And uh, it all ended up, as we know from reading the, the very last words of the book of the Acts of the Apostles, that the Apostle Paul, uh, who did go to Rome, um, and uh, um, he, he ended up incarcerated uh, in Rome. That's, that's about the overview there of what's going on. <clears throat> and... Uh, we can say without any doubt at all that, that um, 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 in, 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 to be um, incarcerated or imprisoned is something that is fundamentally unnatural to us. It's unnatural to life for it to be restricted, and it's certainly unnatural uh, to us as human beings to be locked up. There was a time when I used to do some locking up, and I visited some prisons and to see men 
in virtual cages and big heavy steel gates clanging and locking and so on. And you look at these people, regardless of what they've done, I'm not making any judgment about that. I'm just saying that to be in such a situation is not natural for us at all. And, uh, and certainly as far as the Apostle Paul is concerned, uh, we know from reading through the whole story that he was he was called by God to preach. He was equipped by God to preach. He was he was called to the open road to go out there and travel and preach. And uh, clearly, this was his great joy, and uh, and uh, he, he he saw God by His Spirit working through his ministry and impacting the lives of men and women and transforming. What, 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 what coming in life could be more fulfilling and more wonderful uh, than that? And he was engaged in it, very definitely called by God, called by Jesus himself, as you will remember. And, uh, and he was commissioned to go out into this activity. And uh, he, he knew also that this message that he carried, and don't forget, no one had New Testaments in those days, but he knew that the message that he was carrying He'd received sovereignly from God, and it was the most needed message in the whole world. Um, the gospel was everything, and it was um, um, entrusted to him. He was going out. He'd been doing it. He faced lots of opposition. Of course he did, and we know some of the things that happened to him. But nevertheless, this was his life. It was his joy, and so on. But when we find him in this place at the end of the book of Acts, um, his traveling days are over so far as his mind is concerned at that point anyway. We'll talk about that again in a minute. Um, but not only is he incarcerated, he's imprisoned, he's restricted, he's held in bondage, as it were, by the Roman leadership at that point. Uh, but on top of that, he's awaiting a, a trial before Nero, the Caesar. And uh, he would not know how that was going to turn out. Um, you know, would it be the executioner's sword in the end? And, uh, you know, I think it's, I don't want to uh, impose upon the Apostle Paul that which is completely inappropriate and was never the case. But I'm looking at Paul in this situation with the kind of background I've just uh, described to you. And now he's in this place. And, uh, okay, he said, I'm ready for this. We heard him saying it, and, and praise God for that kind of zeal and, and commitment. But the fact is, as he sat there in that place, not knowing how things were going to unfold ahead, I, I, I mean, what I'm doing, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of highlighting what I think is just his humanity. I'm imagining that if that was me in that situation, um, I think I'd be tempted to ask the kind of question I asked at the top of this talk. And I'd say, you know, was, was anything that I've done in the unfolding of these chapters and these events, was anything I've done or decided, um, was it foolish? Did I make any foolish action? Was it me? And rather than a leading of the Lord and so on. I think I'd be asking myself those kind of things. I might ask myself, looking back to what's in this 21st chapter you're open at, um, what, was I wrong? Was I foolish, at least, to engage in those um, Jewish traditions that uh, you'll find recorded there? Um, was I even foolish to have um, Trophimus uh, it, it, just in the temple, there was that was, was that necessary? Was that a wise thing? Because uh, it somehow changed everything. Um, or then I might be asking myself, um, was I was I foolish to appeal to uh, be tried by Caesar? Chapter twenty-five, I think it's verse eleven. You'll find this was his his choice, and. Uh, um, if you're hearing some dinging going on here, this is, I don't know how to turn that off on my, these are telephone call uh, messages coming in. I can't stop them uh, because they're not mine, they're my wife's. But here I am. The fact is, 
Um, I know that you, as I'm speaking to you today, you, you're not chained by a Roman soldier. Um, you don't feel trapped in that kind of situation, but there is a distinct possibility because I don't know all of the people I'm talking to as I share these things, distinct possibility that perhaps you do feel trapped and kind of chained for one reason or another. Um, it could be because you made a particular decision at, recently or a long time ago, and, or, and you, 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 you took a certain action, um, or perhaps you didn't, take an action that you should feel you should have done as you look back on it. And the fact is, it, it, for some people, those kind of situations bring its own kind of captivity, this own kind of bondage, um, you know, where you think, you know what, as a Christian person, I, th I think I, I think I screwed up back there. Uh, at that particular time. And I know this, and you will know this as well, that as soon as we open the door for this kind of very negative thinking or where we're reviewing things that probably we should have left behind a long time ago or had the Lord deal with a long time ago, but at that particular time when we open the door, we, we do in fact open the door to the enemy. And there is he who is referred to in scripture as the accuser of the brethren, who is, who is always active, always looking to seize upon any moment to trip us up, to bind us up, to hinder us, to damage us, or even to destroy us if he could. Uh, Jesus said that that was about the sum total of what he's all about, um, because the, 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 the Satan is the is the arch enemy of Jesus Christ. As soon as we surrender our lives to him and su surrender our lives to him and seek to live for him and for his glory, it's as though there's a target on our back, as it were, maybe on our front as well. And the enemy's just looking for any opportunity where he can just drive a wedge in with his great sledgehammer of lies and, and bring us into bondage. This is... this. This is my, it goes on in my life. I'm sure it goes on in yours as well, and so on. And and those demonic whispers, I, I can imagine, would tend to say, um, you know what, you, you messed up so badly, you're never ever going to be able to amount to much as far as the things of God are concerned, as far as any kind of ministry is concerned. Perhaps I'm talking to some people who've been involved in, Christian ministry, and then something's derailed <clears throat> without try, <clears throat> trying to imagine what that would be, that brings you to this place and the enemy's saying, okay, that's it, it's all over, you're finished, you know, that's the end of it. And um, of course, it could be other things, other factors are involved. Um, it could be a conclusion that you come to as the result of, um, of, of just your age, you know what, as you get older, and, and you've lost your, your zim and your energies and activities and opportunities, the enemies there say, well, that's, well you're, you're done. You've, you've had your time. There's nothing to look forward to in this life now. And so on. God can't really use you now. Or maybe it's the result of some, some terrible illness that sort of put you out to one side. And, uh, you know, as I'm saying these things, let me just tell you what's coming to my mind. My father was an invalid all of his life, and he had friends who were invalids, and, and some of them came to our house, and I could tell stories about a number of them. Uh, <clears throat> I can remember one man, his name was Bill. I won't put his name out on the internet right now, but his name was Bill. And Bill was a Christian man, a Christian believer. And uh, he, in his earlier life, he believed that God had spoken to him and told him he wanted to, him to go onto the mission field. But, but before that happened, Bill met a young lady and he married the young lady. And as the result of that, he never did get to the mission field. And, and he, he, the lie that he was believing that was just, just eating his very heart away 
was that his disability now, which was terrible, was, was, was an act of God of punishment for what he, for his disobedience back there at that earlier stage, choosing the girl over the leading of, of, of God. Terrible, terrible, tormenting lie. The enemy is, he's, he's, an, he's the accuser of the brethren, but he's, he's the ultimate tormentor. Given an opportunity, he'll have a heyday with you and so on. There are a lot of other issues. Let me just allude to a couple of others. It may be just <clears throat> something that's going on in your home, <clears throat> something that's going on in your marriage, something related to the children. All these kind of issues that are part and parcel of life, they sort of carry with them the potentials um, uh, to, to, to become fodder for the enemy or ammunition for the enemy, I should say, perhaps, and so on. You know, <clears throat> I'm reminded of um, something that an old American preacher said. I never did meet this preacher, but his name was Vance Havner. Some of you will maybe have heard of him. Maybe you've read something of him. He was a unique gentleman um, with a unique story. Um, but I remember him saying on one occasion, <clears throat> he, he was referring back to um, a, a CBS newscaster who was very famous. Um, his name was Walter Cronkite. And every night, this is how the story was told. I, I, when I heard this, I lived in England, so I didn't know CBS and I didn't know Walter Cronkite. I'm more familiar now. Um, but in any event, this is how Vance Havner told the story. He said, every night when Walter Cronkite signs off the, the evening news, he, he, he says, well, that's the way it is. And Vance Havner said, every time I hear him say that, I want to say, no, Walter, you're wrong. That's the way it seems. And I thought that was very interesting. And, uh, you know, um, I, I, I want to address this to you, whoever you are, who are under the attacks of the enemy right now, where you feel you've just been laid aside, there's no future hope for God to really get hold of your life and use you anymore. And you're tempted to sort of allow the words, not that they'll come in this form exactly, uh, to find a lodging place in your heart. Well, that's the way it is. That That's it, you know. And uh, And I want to say to you, the, no, 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 that's not right. That's just the way it seems. That's the way the, the word is coming to you, but it's not coming to you from God. Isn't it amazing how we can be so slow to comprehend the the grace of God? I, lo I love that um, passage in, 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 uh, in Ephesians, um, you know, in chapter 2. Uh, Paul is saying, you know, in time past, we walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now works in the children of disobedience, among whom we all had our manner of life. Uh, in times past, fulfilling the lust to the flesh and the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and whereby nature the children of wrath, even as others. But God, those two words. But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, he hath quickened us together with Christ. By grace, you are saved. Amen. Isn't that wonderful? And I want to bring to you today, my dear friend, uh, the word of God. He's the God of all grace. And uh, his heart is open to you. And, uh, you know, I hope you don't mind me quoting some people outside of the Bible, but uh, I told you I'm from England. Well, once upon a time, there was a prime minister who became a sir, uh, and that his name is Win or was Winston Churchill. And in 1942, in the midst of the, the Second World War, and lots was going on, he made this statement over the air. Uh, he made it at a, at a particular dinner, actually, but it was broadcast all over and it's been repeated, I'm sure, many, many times over the years. 
he said to those who were listening, uh, now this is not the end. He said, it's not even the beginning of the end, but it is perhaps the end of the beginning. And you know what? That doesn't come out of scripture, but I think I can find the truth of scripture resonating in that statement. Uh, you know, when the enemy comes in like a flood, this is the standard we lift up against him. It's the word of God, but God, amen. Yes, this is the way everything's been. Okay, it's the way it's been for a long time. But here now, God is breaking in on a life and he's saying it's time for this lie to be put to an end because it's not the truth. It's not the end of your usefulness. It's not the end of the, the possibilities for the development of your relationship with almighty God and for fellowship to be found with him that's real and filled with joy and that's the gospel. That's the way it goes. You know, as a as a man of God or a woman of God, you you need to accept this, that everything this is a big statement that everything um, is 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 um, uh, subject to and in some way a part of the sovereign God who has chosen you and will fulfill his purpose in your life as you surrender yourself to him. And I, I think the, the, the big issue, the difficult hurdle to get over is to really come to a point where I see and I understand and I dare to believe that everything, that is everything, uh, is, 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 it, it was somehow to prepare me for this moment, everything. Um, and, and that's wonderful. You know, the concept of the sovereignty of God, it holds some features that baffle us. And I know that there's contention out there that I'm very well aware of about how that works itself out. But um, <clears throat> I keep saying, and I'm not trying to be presumptuous or foolish, um, uh, but but I, I, in my heart, I'm not a Calvinist and I'm not an Armenian. And it's, it, it can sound sort of pious, but I mean this. I'm a Biblicist. I believe the Bible. And if the Bible says something, I choose to believe it. Not because one lines up with it in a certain way or another lines up as another way. We could talk about that for a long time, but we want to... The fact of the God being sovereign lies right at the heart of the scriptures. And and we choose to believe it. Uh, and yes, there are issues and aspects of it that are difficult to sort of get our minds around and so on. Um, listen to how the Apostle Paul puts it. This is in that famous Romans 8, 28 verse. And we know, we know this, he said. Uh, that all things, note the words, that all things work together for the good to them that love God, to them who are called according to his purpose. He's not, Paul is not saying, no, everything's going to work out fine and, you know, life's going to be just peaches and cream for the whole journey and painless. And No, uh, the good that he's referring to is the good of the ultimate will and purpose of God that he has concerning your life. And, and the truth is that everything that is part and parcel of your life has been operating under the eye and sovereignty of God. And he's moving you ever deeper, and more fully into the, his purpose, which is purpose, which Paul will elsewhere call the eternal purpose of, of God. Amen. You know, um, the, 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 the truth of God's sovereignty, while it does hold these baffling issues, um, let, let me say this. There's one, there's one thing that we cannot have, we cannot embrace at all, and that is a God who is half sovereign. Can't do that. 
It's an oxymoron. If God is sovereign, he's completely sovereign. And he's our God. He's the God of the Bible. Amen. And he's he's managing everything. He's been managing everything of my life. His hand has been on me all the way through. It doesn't mean I've lived right all the way through, nor does it mean you have. But if he's got you, as it works, use the expression in his crosshairs, he's going to get you. He's, and the Holy Spirit, I've often said, is like the hound of heaven. He keeps pursuing and pursuing and pursuing. And then one day he's got you, got you completely. And that's what's going on. And and the, the fact of everything working together and so on, for, according to his purpose that he has in his mind for my life and your life, um, th this, this doesn't merely refer to... Um, the, his 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 design as though well it's a blueprint, uh, but it also involves something else, which is his timetable. Um, he he times everything. Um, I, I love that phrase back from um, from the book of Esther. Uh, uh, remember where such and such has been taking place, and the statement has been put to her. Who knows if you have not been brought to the throne? for such a time as this, for such a time as this. And, and I want to say to you, who knows that God has not arranged that you'd be listening to this message here today, from this poor man, but you're sensing that God is speaking to you and that he's arranged the, the circumstances, everything that has brought you to this moment, you're here for such a time as this, to hear this word from God. Amen. Um, Esther needed to know that um, that God had um, uh, he, he designed for her to be there at that point in time. She needed to hear this that she was listening to at this point in time, and then she needed the courage to act out what was part and parcel of that particular crisis moment, and so on. Well, having said all of this. Look where Paul was placed. Let me go that back there where we started, in a sense. Um, and here's the wonderful thing. Uh, he, he was not enjoying freedom in, this, in the way that he'd enjoyed it before, but he was enjoying the blessings of God. That's the important thing. Let me read the verse to you. It's right at the end of chapter 28. Um, and... Uh, hmm. In verse 29, and when he had said these words, the Jews departed and had great reasoning among themselves. Here it is. And Paul dwelt two whole years in his own hired house and received all that came to him, preaching the kingdom of God and teaching those things which concern the Lord Jesus Christ with all confidence, no man forbidding him. How about that? He wasn't enjoying the open road and the excitement of the cities that he'd visited and the meetings that he'd been very much a part of and so on. Uh, but God had sovereignly placed him in that particular situation at that time. I believe that in his sovereignty. Although Paul might have looked back and he may not have looked back and thought, was I stupid to do this or stupid to do that and so on. But at the end of the day, the answer to that really is irrelevant. What is true is that God has overruled everything and brought him to this moment because I believe God wanted him right here where he is at this point in time. And God's got you right there where you where he wants you or intends you to be at this moment, no matter what it looks like. You may not be enjoying all the sort of things that life can offer for us. It may not be that your life's ministry is working out the way you kind of hoped or believed it would do. But the fact is, God's got you where he wants you. And that's that's a wonderful truth to really get hold of. And and for, for Paul, this was a remarkable situation. He, he, he's in his own hired house. Uh, yes, there's a big disadvantage. Sitting next to him is a Roman soldier. And he's chained to the Roman. And soldier, so he's lost that kind of freedom, and that must have been a pretty horrible thing, uh, humanly speaking. 
course. Um, uh, but but hang on, uh, he, he, he was able to have his friends come. There would be some from the from the local church, the new fledgling church in Rome, but the others from the various areas where he'd been traveling from far and wide. They they would come and they had the opportunity to gather with him. And um, uh, in those situations, the Apostle Paul seized every opportunity. I love the way the last verse reads that uh, he was preaching the kingdom of God and teaching those things that concern the Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. And, uh, you know, some of these visiting companions, some of them are mentioned as we reach around in his various letters. <clears throat> Um, men like Epaphroditus or Tychicus or Onesimus, for example. Uh, these were significant individuals uh, that we read about elsewhere. But they, they came and they came from their respective areas, from Philippi and from Ephesus and from Colossae. And Onesimus, he came uh, uh, from Philemon, he was Philemon's slave. And a lot more can be said about this. People came and they were bringing reports of how God was moving in the various locations. And one really amazing thing to me is this, that the Apostle Paul, who's OK, is in his own hired house. But if he's sitting there, he's chained to a Roman soldier. If they keep switching off in their various shifts, um, all of his private things have to be done in that kind of context. Now he's got friends coming in, he's talking to them and fellowshipping with them. And I think, how in the world, Paul, were you able to sit down and write the kind of letters that you wrote uh, to the Philippians and the Ephesians and the Colossians and to Philemon? And we know that he wrote each of those from that hired house where he was on that occasion. How, did, I, I, you know, the more I thought about it, I thought, what kind of a mind has he got that God is using here, that he's able to concentrate in such a manner that we've got these amazing, amazing epistles uh, here that we have. But God was in the whole thing. God had him there. And of course, right up to this very present moment, and if the Lord tarries on into the future, uh, those letters were the product of his isolation and his captivity uh, and look how they're continuing to bless the people of God everywhere even you and even me amen let me just as I draw to a close just say this I believe there was there was a yet another reason why God had Paul there in that situation because um, I've mentioned already, or at least I've alluded to the fact that all of our circumstances, our present circumstances, have been tailor-made for us by God. And there was something else going on besides anything that I've just been talking about. And uh, and it was this, that, that God needed to have Paul in such a posture of heart and disposition, even in this complicated, uncomfortable isolation, God got him there and was able to do uh, and accomplish in him and even the work in his heart. Um, what, um, <clears throat> and that's what God's up to with you and with me. He's looking to do something deeper. This is like Paul's priority was to go out and preach this necessary vital gospel to everyone. And God's saying, well, hang on, I need to do something more in you. And this was the way God chose to do it. Reminds me of something I heard David Wilkerson say a long, long time ago now. Uh, but he'd been preaching everywhere and then um, uh, the Lord closed things down for him without going into a lot of detail. And he spent six months, he, he said, I had him the, uh, right at the other end of this period. And uh, he said that God isolated him. Because, and this is how he put it. He said, God showed me that he, God, was more concerned about evangelizing me than he was that I should evangelize the world. God's always looking to do a deeper work in my heart and in your heart. And God knows where best he can accomplish that and under what circumstances would be most appropriate for him to have your attention in the way God needs it. Thinking of that, 
I could draw to a close by quoting Charles Wesley. And Charles Wesley said, Now, Jesus, let thy powerful death into my being come. Slay the old Adam with thy breath, the man of sin consume. My old affections mortify, nail to the cross my will. Daily and hourly bid me die or altogether kill. Oh, let it now make haste to die. The mortal wound receive, so shall I live. And yet not I, but Christ in me shall live. Amen. So here we have, here we have the Apostle Paul. You know what he didn't know? He didn't know that at the end of two years he'd be released without ever seeing uh, Nero. Uh, we're led to believe that during that period, those Jewish accusers, they'd not followed him. They were not there. There was no one to give the kind of evidence that they wanted to give uh, and so on. And that's where Luke decides to leave the story. Just leave it there. Some of us have wondered why, perhaps, but nevertheless, that's the way it is. <laughs> that's the way it is. Um, and we must leave it there. Another great hymn writer of yesteryear said, and all is right that seems most wrong if it be his sweet will. God was working in Paul. God used him in a different role for those two years. And Paul, this great heart, uh, he sees the opportunity that God gave him without complaint. And he did a masterly job. And we know that by reading what he wrote during that time. But he was acquitted. His accusers never showed up. And his chains, listen, were his making. Amen. And that's what you and I need to realize. Whatever the restrictions are that are on us, God is in control and is wanting to work something through these trying moments, these questioning moments, and accomplish something in our lives that he knows he can only accomplish in this way. Mm -hmm. Amen. Chains may be, but... Um, unique opportunities which are there to be seized. If this talk has been a blessing to you, do go to my YouTube channel, which is Turn to the Scriptures with Fred Tomlinson, and maybe you'll subscribe and identify with me and what we're doing there. May God bless you. Thank you. Well, Again, I don't want to talk too much because that was such the honey from the honeycomb. And I just want it to resonate now with those that are hearing it. So I want to thank you once again for blessing all of us. We just so much enjoy your teaching. It, it, your teaching truly is truly the food, it's truly the bread of life. And it's really rare these days thank you god bless you Joni, and all that you're doing amen well good. You. see you in again a few weeks you bet bye-bye